So Lord, help us to, to live like you lived. And Lord, we pray this morning that you would speak to us, that you would open our minds and hearts to what it is that you would have us learn so that we can live our lives more the way you want us to. We thank you, Lord, and we pray all of these things in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Amen. Go ahead and take a seat, and as you're sitting down, take your Bibles or your Bible app, whatever you read your Bible on, and turn to Colossians chapter 2. Colossians chapter 2. If you don't have a Bible with you, please feel free to grab one of the pew Bibles. Uh, And if you don't have a Bible at home, please feel free to take one of those pew Bibles and take it home with you. Uh, We really do want everybody to have a Bible in their home that they can read, that they can refer to and and reference when they need to. Uh, So please feel free to take one of those Bibles home if you need that. Uh, Let me open by asking a question. How many of you have seen or you yourself have run into something or tripped over something because you weren't watching where you were going? Yeah, pretty much all of us. You know, I've probably done it today. But... If you have children or grandchildren, you see this on a regular basis, don't you? Because this is something that little kids do all of the time. I have a three-year-old at home, and he's constantly running into things. And he has done this from the moment that he started walking. Uh, I distinctly remember when he first started walking. And you know how little kids, they get really excited uh, when they learn to walk, and they kind of get overexcited about the fact that they can walk? And one of these times, Knox was walking through the living room, and he had just learned to walk, and he's, he's you know, barely you know, holding himself up, and he looks back to see what mommy and daddy are doing, to see if we're watching him, and as he's walking and looking back, he plowed right into the wall. Bam! <laughs> Fell right on his back. And that's what little kids do, and he is now almost four years old, and he does this on a regular basis. He did it yesterday. A couple of weeks ago was really bad. He was running through the house. My son is a runner. He never walks anywhere. He runs everywhere. And he was running through the house. He was on his way into the kitchen to get his cup because he was thirsty. And he's running into the kitchen and he got distracted by something beside him. And so as he's turning the corner into the kitchen, he's looking to to his side and turned and hit the corner of the countertop. Completely clotheslined him. I mean, he was out down on the ground, screaming, crying, upset, and rightly so. He got like a golf ball-sized whelp on his forehead. And for about a week and a half, he had one of those like little rectangular marks where the countertop had connected with him. Um, But (laughs) if you ask him, he goes, my ouchie is healed. Um, But he does this all the time. Yesterday, I'm chasing him through the house. So I'm probably a little at fault for this, but I'm chasing him through the house. We're playing, and he looks back to see where I'm at and trips over the dog on his way through. Bam! Right on his face, right on the tile floor. Because he wasn't watching where he was going. And we've seen this. We ourselves do it uh, on a regular basis. And Chet actually alluded to this two weeks ago when he preached and kind of foreshadowed what I'm preaching today. He made the statement two weeks ago, where the head goes, the body goes. And isn't that true? Wherever the head is leading, that's where the body is going to go. And if we're not following where the head is leading us, we're going to get ourselves in trouble. We're going to get ourselves hurt. I remember when I was in high school and I was in football, one of my coaches told me, when you're running and you're in the game, you keep your eyes where you're wanting to go. Don't look at the guy beside you, don't look at the guy heading towards you to hit you, because if you have your eyes in the direction you're going, it gives you more stability. And that's true. If I'm running this direction, but I'm looking this direction, I'm much more likely to get caught off guard or trip on something or or fall. And so that's what we're going to be talking about today. Take your Bibles and look at Colossians chapter 2. We're going to start in verse 6 and read through verse 15. But as we're reading this, I want you to take note of something. Notice how often it uses the phrase, in him or with him, as we read through this. So starting chapter 2, verse 6, it says, Therefore, as you received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk... In him, rooted and built up in him, 
and established in faith just as you were taught, abounding in thanksgiving. See to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy or empty deceit according to human tradition, according to the elemental spirits of the world, and not according to Christ. For in him the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily, and you have been filled in him who is the head of all rule and authority. In him also you were circumcised with a circumcision made without hands, by putting off the body of flesh by the circumcision of Christ, having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through faith in the powerful working of God who raised him from the dead. And you, who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him, having forgiven us of all our trespasses, by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. This he set aside, nailing it to the cross. He disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them in him. This passage is nine verses long. And in those nine verses, it says, in him or with him, nine times. Now, you've heard Chad and Chet and myself say multiple times, when a Bible passage repeats something, it's trying to get a point across. And that's exactly what this passage is trying to do. When I researched uh, this sermon, there's only two other passages in the whole Bible that uses in him or with him this often. And so we need to pay attention. We need to notice something about this. What does it mean to be in him. Well, verse 6 gives us the first indication. Verse 6 says, Therefore, as you received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him. To be in him means that we walk in him. We walk in him. We walk in Christ. And when we walk in him, that means that we have a life-changing relationship with Jesus. You know, if you've ever wondered or ever been curious, where in the Bible does it talk about having a relationship with Jesus? This is one of those passages. The fact that it says over and over that we're to be in him, that we're supposed to be in Christ, tells us that we can have a life-changing relationship with our Savior. And so we walk in him. Because let's face it, if we were a body without a head, because this passage in 1 Corinthians 12 talks about Christ being the head of the body and we are part of the body. If we're running around without a head, what are we going to do? We're going to fall. We're going to stumble. We're going to run into things. It's not going to be a pretty thing. I'm not talking about just being blind or deaf. I'm talking about running around without a head. We can't do it. You see, we can't function correctly without Christ as the head of our lives. Because without Christ, what are we following the lead of? What are we chasing after? Our sinful desires. Without Christ in our lives and us walking in him and having that relationship, we're not pursuing Christ and the things that he wants us to pursue. We're pursuing, we're chasing after our sinful desires. And where are those sinful desires ultimately going to lead? Destruction. If when my son runs around the house not watching where he's going, what's going to happen to him? He's going to get hurt. He's going to run into something. He's going to get knocked down by something. He's going to trip over something. And we spiritually are the same way. If we don't have Christ, if we're not walking in him, we're a body without a head. And we will constantly find ourselves falling, stumbling, tripping over things, and injuring ourselves spiritually. Because those desires that we're following, those inward desires, are going to destroy us. So when we walk in him, this passage goes on to explain that we are also rooted and built up in him. We are rooted and built up in him. Look at verses 7 and 8. It says... Rooted and built up in him and established in the faith just as you were taught, abounding in thanksgiving. 
See to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit according to human tradition, according to elemental spirits of the world, and not according to Christ. You see, when we're rooted and built up in Christ, we have stability. What's the illustration here? It's a root. If a tree has no roots, what's going to happen to it? It's going to fall over. It's not going to have any stability. It's not going to be able to hold itself up. The roots are what helps the tree stand strong. When a wind blows against a tree, it's only through the power of the roots that we can't see underground that that tree can sustain itself, that it can stand. And our relationship with Christ enables us to do the same thing. When those winds of the world, when all of those deceits and those lies are thrown against us and blow us, then it's through the power and stability of Christ who has rooted us that we can stand strong. Because if we don't have Christ, we don't have the roots. We're also built up. And that basically means that without the root system, does a tree grow? No. Because where does the tree get its sustenance? Where does it get the things that it needs for nourishment? From what the roots bring in. So without the roots, not only can the tree not stand, the tree can also not grow. And that's what this passage is telling us. It's through Christ that we're rooted, we have stability, and we also have the ability to grow. So that when the lies, when the things that the world tells us, when those things come against us, We have the stability and the knowledge and the growth to stand up against them. And without that, we will fall into those lies and deceptions. Because we need the roots of Christ in our life to hold us strong. Also, when we walk in him, we are filled in him. We are filled in him. Look at verses 9 and 10. It says... For in him the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily. And you have been filled in him who is the head of all rule and authority. You see, we are filled in him. And verse 9 says that in him the fullness of deity dwells bodily. Basically, all of God is Jesus. Jesus is all of God. Chad spoke about this last week. God is is Jesus. Jesus is God. It's not God the Son, God the Father, God the Holy Spirit, three persons. They are one. They are the same. It's a mystery that we will never understand. But the fact is, is that Jesus is God. Jesus is Lord. And because we're filled through the power of Jesus Christ, we're being filled directly from the power of God. We're not being filled from some knowledge that doesn't do us much good. We're being filled from the spiritual sustenance, the spiritual food that we need to survive. We reap the benefit of Jesus' godhood when we walk with him. When we have that life-changing relationship and we live in him, we reap the benefits of his power and his authority. So we have to make the choice to live in him. Not only do we walk in him, but we are also raised up in him. We are also raised up. Look at verses 11 through 14. It says, In him also you were circumcised with a circumcision made without hands, by putting off the body of flesh by the circumcision of Christ, having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through faith in the power, powerful working of God, who raised him from the dead. And you who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive. Together with him, having forgiven us of all our trespasses, by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. This he set aside, nailing it to the cross. Guys, we've been raised up with him. And when we celebrate baptism up in this baptistry or down in the lake, there is a deep, intimate meaning to that. 
When you're taken down under the water, it symbolizes you being buried. Your old self is being buried and done away with through Christ. And then when you're raised up out of the water, it's symbolizing that you are a new creation. That the old has been buried and it's left there and you are risen up brand new. You're changed. You're different. That's why we talk about a life-changing relationship. Is because when you come... The symbolism is is that you come up in Jesus and you are new. The old is gone. Your sin, your past is wiped clean. Because Christ has buried it with his burial and risen you brand new. You see, spiritually, we are dead. We are dead with no hope of coming back to life. Think about it for a second. Can a head without a body live? No. If you don't have a head, you're not alive. Your head is vital. It is important. It's necessary to your survival. So you can't live without your head, but spiritually, that's what we are until we step into a life-changing relationship with Jesus. Just like 1 Corinthians 12 talks about Christ being the head of the body and us being the body. Without Christ being our head, we're dead in our sin, in our trespasses. And it's not until we accept that life-changing relationship that Christ becomes our head and we are then spiritually alive. And so we need that relationship. We need to have Jesus Christ come into our lives and like verse 14 says, take our sins and nail them to the cross. Because without him, we have no hope. And let me make this abundantly clear. This is not a nice novelty concept. This is not, oh, this is a great idea or this would be nice to have. It's a necessity. It's it's a need. It's not a want. It's not a desire. It is a have to. You cannot live spiritually without Christ as the head of your life. You are spiritually dead without the life-saving act of Jesus Christ in your life. Because when Jesus died on the cross, he conquered death. He triumphed over it. And we reap the benefits of not having to live in those sins anymore. But we have to have him as the head of our lives in order for that to happen. But because of this, if we step into that relationship, we have victory in him. We have victory in him. Look at verse 15. It says, He disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them in him. He triumphed over, he gained victory over everything through the death and resurrection. Because of our relationship with him, we have victory. We have the triumph over sin. Without that relationship with Jesus Christ, we can't. We don't have the spiritual, mental, or physical power to resist what sin is doing to our lives. It's only through that relationship with Christ that we can be saved from what sin is destroying inside of us. It's only through Christ that we can gain the healing that we need to be saved from our sins. So think about this for a second. Jesus gives us the power to have victory over sin, but the sad part about this is most of us are not living in victory because we're not truly walking in Christ. We come to church on Sunday morning, and we may go through a few of the motions, but how many of us walk in Christ? We're all guilty of straying from him from time to time, aren't we? Because what is Christ as the head, go back to my illustration of Knox running through my house, what does Christ as the head do? As the head, he points us in the direction that we're supposed to be going. And we go, and we go, and we have victory over sin because he's giving us that guidance, he's giving us that direction. And so we gain victory over sin, but what do we do? We're running along and we're following the the path that Jesus has in front of us and we're doing good and then, ooh, something shiny. And we get distracted, don't we? And we go away from the path that Christ had for us and we do this. 
Notice I didn't go very far because I'm not watching where I'm going. Because what's going to happen? If I kept going, not only am I going to hurt myself, but Jesse's going to be really mad at me. But we chase those shiny things, those temptations, those sins. Guys, we have victory over sin, but it doesn't mean that sin's not still going to be there. It doesn't mean that temptation is going to go away. It means that it's still there, but we still have the guidance of Jesus Christ to get us back on the right path. We have Jesus as the head to point us in the right direction. But because we don't live in Christ, sometimes we don't feel the victory because we chase after the shiny things, don't we? We get distracted and we do this. And it ends up hurting us. You know, how many of us have gone through a moment in our lives or are going right now through a moment where you feel defeated? The answer is walk in Christ. How many of us have or are right now going through a time where you feel like there's no hope? Walk in Christ. How many times do you or, or have you gone through a time when you say, I just don't feel like I'm close to God. I feel like God is so far away. Walk in Christ. You see, when we feel far from God, whose fault is that? Does that mean that God has walked away from us? No. It means that we have walked away from him. And so when we go through those moments of hopelessness, when we go through those moments where we're desperate and we're living in despair and we feel far away from God, it's because God has been directing us one direction and we've gone another. And we have to make the choice to say, yes, God, I'm going to stop going this way and go the direction you want me to go. Walk in him. It's not him who has walked away from you. It's you that has walked away from him. You see, God knows that we're going to stumble and sin, doesn't he? He knows that we're human. He knows that we're going to stumble and fall into our sins and we're going to mess our lives up. He knows this. But listen to this. Please understand this. God is far less concerned about your sin and he is much more concerned with the way you respond to your sin. Think about the Bible. Think about every story that you've ever read in God's word and what is it full of? It's full of stories of men who have blown their lives up because of their sin and their doubt And them turning to God and God doing something great. Because God doesn't care so much about the sin. He knows it's going to happen. He cares much more about how we respond to the sin. When we turn around and we go, God, I'm going to chase the shiny thing even though you're pointing me this way. And we run into a wall or we trip over a speaker and we hurt ourselves. What do you do? Do you continue to trip over the speaker or run into the wall? Or do you stand up, shake it off and go, God, I'm sorry. What was I thinking? I'm going to get back with you. That's what God cares about, people. He doesn't care if you slipped. It doesn't matter what you've done. It doesn't matter how bad you've messed things up. It doesn't matter what sin you've committed. God is there to say, come back. He is there when we get clotheslined by a kitchen countertop. He's there to sweep down and pick us up and hold us in his arms And comfort us and heal us and get us through the pain that we're going through. When my son ran into that kitchen countertop, he had to deal with the discomfort that came from it. Me picking him up and comforting him did not mean that the pain went away. It meant that he could now deal with the pain because his father was there to help him walk through it. And eventually he was healed of it. And that's how God works in our lives. We stumble, we fall, we hurt ourselves spiritually, and God is there to to pick us up and comfort us and love on us and lead us into healing. And all we have to do is say, God, I'm sorry, I can't believe I did that. Help me to get back on the right path. Just turn away from that straying that you're doing and get back on the right path and let God heal Let God take care of those things. It may take time to get the healing, but God's going to be there to scoop you up and see you through it because he loves us so much. That's what I did with my son, and if I'm 
that good with my kid, God's infinitely better. Because he loves us so desperately, he wants to heal us. He wants to help us. He wants to love on us when we fall. He knows we're going to stumble, so just acknowledge it and get back on the right track. That's what he wants. He cares about our response much more than he cares about the sin itself. So here's my challenge. This doesn't just happen on its own. You're not going to get up tomorrow morning and just instinctively follow Christ because you came to church this morning. No, my challenge is tomorrow morning, you wake up, you put your feet on the ground, and you say, God, I'm going to walk with you today. I choose today to walk with you. I choose to follow your direction in my life. I've been going this way, and I know you want me to go that way, so I'm going to go this way today. And then the next day, you do the same thing. You get up, you put your feet on the ground, and you tell God, I'm going to do my best to walk with you. Help me. You have to make the choice. So here's my question. Do you have Jesus Christ as the head of your life? Is he leading? Is he guiding? Have you ever stepped in to that life-changing relationship with him? And if so, are you choosing to follow his headship? Are you choosing day in and day out to follow his direction? And if you've stumbled, why not step up, shake it off, and follow where God's leading you? Why not start that right now? Join me in prayer. Almighty God, we thank you so much for today. And Lord, again, we thank you for the freedom that we have to come in to this place and worship you and hear your word. And God, we pray that you would help us to, to be grateful and to appreciate that. And help us, Lord, out of that gratitude to seek you day in and day out. Help us to every day to seek to follow you, to walk in you, to make that choice. So, Lord, we thank you so much. And we pray all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen.